Welcome to our town hall hearing on black on black crime and gun violence in our communities. Um, obviously a topic that has pressed us for generations now. And we're here today uh, to talk about some things uh, relative to that issue that we think have worked. Because too often in settings like this, what happens is there's a criticism of whichever organization is hosting it for doing too much talking. You know, we have this serious issue facing our communities. Our children are dying every day. And all you guys want to do is talk, talk, talk. Well, that's not what we have here today. Uh, we have people assembled uh, in front of you that you're going to be hearing from who have taken action, meaningful, successful action when it comes to reducing violence in our communities and some of our toughest communities and schools. And I want to give you an opportunity to hear from them and get some of their insights and perspective on what it takes for us to turn that situation around in our community. Just before I came in today, I was watching CNN, and they had on one of the uh, Sandy Hook parents. If you remember in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, just a couple of months ago, and her plea was that we not forget. She was saying that I think people are already starting to forget us, but we the parents of Newtown haven't forgotten anything. And I thought to myself, well, no, I don't think the parents in any other city around this country where every day we see our children gunned down have forgotten anything either. So the way we're going to proceed is I'm going to allow each panelist eight to 10 minutes to offer their insight and perspective on the issue. And this is a terrific, this is an amazing panel that we have assembled here. Um, at the end of it, we will hear from a woman, Ms. Tarek O'Reilly, who can give you, unfortunately, a firsthand account of her experience with violence in our communities and press on the urgency of us continuing the action that some of these individuals have taken and building on the action that some of these individuals has taken to really see a change in our communities across the country. So I'm going to start at this end and work my way down. The first individual you will hear from is Captain Troy Doyle. He is the commander of the first precinct of the St. Louis County Police in North St. Louis County. Uh, it is a majority black area. He has seen every kind of crime that you can imagine. He deals with particularly uh, our youth who are involved in crime. He has contact with those youth every day. He's an individual that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Uh, we've worked together in the past, and I know that he and I look forward to working together in the future to really make a difference in our community because we know it can be done. I serve over about 100 some thousand people in the incorporated North St. Louis County. Uh, it's broken down demographically wise, about 60% African American, 40% Caucasian. Uh, we have homes that range anywhere from 10,000 to homes that range to in the areas of 700,000. And believe it or not, we have violence in both areas, in our socially low economically depressed areas as well as our affluent areas. What we have done in regards to our uh, enforcement up in the precinct in regards to youth violence is uh, two things. We have obviously done enforcement suppression programs where we go out and do uh, gang sweeps, things of that nature. We also have done a pretty good job in documenting who these youth are in regards to who are actually, you know, committing these violent acts in our community. Roughly unincorporated North St. Louis County, we have 20 gangs, and out of the 20 gangs, they represent 284 different ind individuals. The uh, reason I bring it up is because it's not easy to be documented in a gang in St. Louis County. A kid can't just raise his hand and say, I'm a gang member. There has to be other contributions to, in order for us to put him in or she into a gang file. For example, the person hanging out with a gang member don't necessarily mean that you a gang member. It just means that you happen to live in a neighborhood where you got friends that are out doing things that they shouldn't be doing, but you're just hanging out with them. But if you're hanging out with them, you're wearing the colors, you got tattoos with the gang insignia then, 
those are things that we can do to put you in a gang. As I mentioned, we got 284 of those type of individuals in unincorporated St. Louis County. Again, we also do a intervention with our uh, youth. Whenever we do out, go out and do our gang suppression, we come across these at-risk youths. Uh, once we bring them into the precinct, we try to identify what the uh, root causes are. Uh, for example, I mean, we can go out here and we can lock everybody up in a community that's out doing something you know, violent, but again, that's not going to solve things that's going on in the community. Because as soon as we arrest them up, there's another whole generation that's going to come up and it's going to perpetrate the same thing. So when we come across these uh, youth at risk, what we try to do is imp uh, implement like an intervention program. We have uh, partnered up with outside agencies such as Better Family Life, the Urban League, and when we come across these individuals, we then refer them um, to those outside agencies. Our gangs are, are a little bit different than our city counterparts. Um, our gangs in North, unincorporated North St. Louis County is more involved in property crimes. However, we do have our occasional drive-by shooting and our violence, but usually it's, uh, our gangs are mainly school-based and neighborhood-based. Um, solution, again, um, it's not and it's probably going to sound weird coming from somebody in law enforcement, but it ain't a police problem. Like I said, we can't, we can't arrest our way out of this, uh, this deal. It's going to have to start with education. We do DARE programs and great programs, which law enforcement put on, but uh, I call those one-hitter programs because you get them one time, like in fifth grade or in elementary school, and then after that, you never hear nothing about it again. So what I proposed uh, in order to have a huge impact on reducing youth violence is getting these kids as they enter kindergarten and come up with programs that's sustainable that can go from elementary to middle to get them all the way out through high school. If not, then we, again, we're going to continue to deal with the same issue. The kids we come across, most of them I've learned is that a lot of them are self-esteem issues. You know, a lot of them, uh, for whatever reason, uh, dislike themselves, dislike the people who look like them dislike their community, but again, it all boils down to our self-esteem issues, and, um, and I'll, if we get into the topic later of education, but um, self-knowledge is more important than anything, and uh, if, if, once these kids get to know who they are as an individual and not what was, and again, I'm veering towards education a little bit, but not what they was taught to be in school, then again, they have more self-dignity and um, more respect for themselves. Thank you. Our next panelist is Reverend Starsky Wilson. Um, if you're from St. Louis, he really needs no introduction. If you're not from St. Louis, let me tell you, this is a young man who uh, lives his faith. Just kind of talk about a couple of hats uh, that we. Um, wear in, in this service, and one of them uh, is as a pastor of a church uh, in a distressed community in North St. Louis. Uh, as we talk about that, the, the context is this. Uh, at the beginning of April, on April 3rd, as a matter of fact, in Jefferson City was released the Kids Count Missouri report. Uh, in that report, it noted that, uh, and what they do is they track county by county um, the uh, statistics on children throughout the uh, state. Uh, one of the things that we recognize is that 16% uh, as we talk about poverty as a root cause, um, the child well-being, the greatest indicator of child well-being is the education of the parents, uh, particularly the mother. 16% of all children in the state of Missouri are born to a mother without a high school diploma, thus setting them on to a negative path. As we talk about um, eligibility for free and reduced lunch, uh, we recognize that 48% of all children in Missouri are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Once you come into the city of St. Louis, that number jumps up to 86% of all children. Of course, that is a great proxy for poverty in our community. So as we talk about this, what we're talking about is child well-being. We're talking about the community of peace that we're able to place around our children. And, and in, in that same report, that Kids Count report, it notes that the incidence of violence for young people between 15 and 19 is twice, in the city of St. Louis, it is twice that of the average of other counties throughout Missouri. So when we start talking about this matter in the state of Missouri, we're talking about where we live and we're talking about a matter related to poverty very explicitly for our children. 
Uh, the first hat that I wear is, is one of clergy, uh, as we talked about before. So from a clergy perspective, my suggestion is one of the things that we must do in order to address this issue is recognize it as an issue of the church's mission, an issue of the church's mission. Uh, as we talk about that from the faith community, we recognize that as we talk about violence, that's a negative approach, but rather when we turn it around, we are called to preach the gospel of peace, right? If we're called to preach the gospel of peace, then what, what we must do as gospel is share good news, shine a light on the positive things that are going on in our community, provide the community awareness as much of this issue, the realities thereof of violence, as, as we provide awareness of the great programs, issues, and ways that we are addressing that. So what are the good things that our young people are doing? Uh, what are the positive things that are going on in our community? The other thing I suggest about this is, uh, and you know this, uh, as we look at the uh, landscape and real estate of our communities that if you want to know where the violence is look for where the churches are I, that's an unfortunate correlation but this is the reality we have real estate in the places in the neighborhoods in the hot spots where the police uh, need where the police invest their resources where they want to reduce crime I say that to say it is an opportunity for us because we have spaces in these areas my church is in 63107 uh, 63106 and 63107 are places where everybody can get grant money to do work but nobody has a location to get the work done as we talk about that that just tells me it's an opportunity that I don't have to program the church building rather if I open the church building there are people who need to bring resources into the building for the sake of the community I say that's an opportunity for us to turn our churches into spaces of reconciliation because truth be told we don't know the programs best ourselves but others of our partners do the other of course is just in our teaching and skill building uh, there's one who's coming after me who can say talk about that better than I can uh, but as we talk about the work that we're called to do that we must build in the community the skills for reconciliation uh, for um, for the reduction of violence in their activities the second hat that I'll talk about uh, is from a community investment standpoint Point. I also serve uh, as the leader of a faith-based foundation uh, in this area and part of the work that we do there is for the last year I've served as the co-chair of a regional youth violence prevention task force. It's one of those groups that does a lot of talking. Um, we do a lot of talking but prayerfully we do it with purpose. We do it because this is not just a problem with young people. It's not just a problem in the black community. It is a problem with the structures and the infrastructure of a community that not only allows for violence but precipitates it by producing more poverty and by creating more disparity. So when we talk about that, we have to talk about it not just among the African American community and not just among churches and service providers but um, um, corporations need to understand that it's a regional competitive issue and we have to make the case that way. If the, RC, if the regional chamber only hears a case of economic development, then we have to make the case for peace as an economic development and regional competitiveness issue. And so we work in a multi-sector way, bringing different people together to look at data. These are the things we found in the last year and I'll be done. Number one, uh, in conversation just earlier this week with Chief Isom, the former chief of the St. Louis Public uh, St. Louis Police Department, we recognize that youth violence statistics are not isolated to be tracked by the SLP, uh, by the St. Louis Police Department. What does that mean? You know that you measure what matters, right? If you care about how much money you got, you count your money, you budgeting your money, you invest in your money. Well, if we're not separately tracking by, by department, youth violence statistics, then we have decided that they don't matter at the same degree. So one of the things that we can do just very basically to suggest that this is something that counts for us is to count this. Um, so, so we have to engage in different kinds of data gathering. The other, uh, as we talk about it, is community mobilization to address systems change. One of the things that Chief Isom in one of our conversations very early on talked about was that we must be called upon, uh, everybody gets money to reduce violence. Everybody, the police get money to reduce it, the school systems get money to reduce it, um, the uh, public health institutions get money to reduce it. Are they working together to pool their resources or are they coming up with their own programs that they can brand to raise money, to leverage money, and to get their own investment? The, re the reality is the latter. The question is how can we come together and invest our resources together? The last two things I'll say, uh, you've had here representation from the Wyman Teen Outreach Program. We must replicate the things that work all over the country, People are replicating the Wyman Center's teen outreach program. Why? Because it reduces youth violence. It has a 100% uh, um, uh, placement rate of students who are going to college. Uh, it reduces teen pregnancy and it, it makes grades go up. Dr. Real Ross is one of the most honored and awarded.
more than medical professionals, professionals in our community. Uh, what I've always respected and admired about him is not only is he an excellent practitioner in the field of medicine and does he do excellent work in the field of medicine, but he gives to the community. A little debate in this country about gun control, right? And, and it's been so, there's been this false dichotomy. On the one hand, we have this one group saying, well, gosh, we need to limit uh, high capacity gun, uh, am, uh, guns. We need to reduce assault weapons. We need background checks. That's absolutely correct. On the other hand, there's a group saying, well, you know, guns aren't the problem. You know, we have individuals with mental illness who, you know, we need to increase the capacity of our institutions to address those issues. Is that correct? That's equally correct. Here's an issue. We haven't had a consensus. We haven't had a coming together of those equally valid comments. And we need to have a little political uh, dialogue about that because unfortunately the kids who are under 20 are the ones who are suffering disproportionately from this gun violence. Let me put this in perspective. Now here, now this is not just in St. Louis, but nationally. One out of five kids under age 20 have an underlying mental disorder. One out of five. Think about that. I said there are five kids in this room who I, who I think under 20. There are many of us who feel 20. Ma'am, okay, I'm with you. I feel that way too. But there are only five of us who are under 20. Now, this is an issue that was really highly relevant to David Satcher when he was Surgeon General. You know, first, you know, just remarkable uh, brother, Surgeon General. He published a report in 2001 about, about youth violence and gun control and really asserted that, that we need to have a comprehensive strategy that actually addresses reduction of guns, but the appropriate uh, uh, allocation of resources to improve behavioral and mental health in our kids. Now, now, unfortunately, it didn't get a whole lot of traction there, right? So we still are dealing with this issue. Now, I, you know, I, and so we've tried our best over the past five years to develop a more effective strategy, and I, you know, and, and within the confines of Washington University School of Medicine and our Institute for Public Health. We're working with groups uh, like uh, David Satcher, and we're working with groups like um, the, uh, um, the School of Public Health in Philadelphia, um, uh, Drexel, uh, on, on, on effective strategies. And here's what we're debating, and, you know, and, I, and I'm going to conclude in about two minutes because I'm going to have questions for this. We're realizing that the most effective strategies, when you're hearing from uh, our, these esteemed colleagues, is that it has to be what we call ecological. It has to be across the whole stratum of our existence. Now, let's start with the kids. Let's start with how they believe and what they believe and how they feel susceptible. And then let's look out into the, you know, the, the social norms, the people around them, and then the environment, the greater environment that's around them, you know, you know, the, the, the schools, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the jobs, and then the policies around this. If you have stress in one of those ecological circles, then you have a stressful environment that will predispose to uh, violence. And the problem is that there's stress throughout that strata. There's stress in our kids. As I said, our, you know, one in five of our kids have this sense of hopelessness, you know, the sense of, my goodness, no one's there to support me. And as a consequence, they're more likely to be stressed. Let me put that in perspective. A good friend of mine, John Rich, who's at Drexel uh, uh, School of Public Health, wrote a great book that you guys should read. It's called Wrong Place, Wrong Time. Wrong place, wrong time, John Rich, R-I-C-H. And he actually spends some time talking with kids who've been victims of, of youth violence, gang, uh, gang violence. And these kids are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, the, the same thing you heard from the Vietnam vo uh, veterans, uh, you know, uh, Iraq war, you could go all the way back, World War II, the same PTSD. These are kids are waking up screaming. They're having nightmares. Uh, you know, they are dysfunctional. How on earth do you expect them to be healthy uh, if you have that? And so our kids are stressed. Our communities are stressed for the reasons that you just, you know, are very well articulated. They're stressed with, this, well, with the broken windows hypothesis that was promulgated in 1982, that when you have broken windows, you have broken hearts. And until we fix our community, you're gonna, you can't fix the hearts. And so, you ha and, and, we're, and, and I can go on and on and on about this, but so in conclusion, We've recognized that we simply can't just do one of those interventions. We need to take the guns off the street, absolutely. But we have to have a concerted effort to improve the health of our kids. We have to have behavioral health 
uh, providers. We have to have funding for behavioral health providers. We have, to ha we have to have more mentorship for these kids. Big brothers and big sisters, mentors, St. Louis, there was a great program, but, we, but there are not enough of those. We need more of those. But most importantly, we have to start making, a, a, uh, addressing the unfortunate uh, problems that we have of, in our, of, of stress in our community. The next gentleman I'm going to bring up uh, lived some of that experience, was a part of it in a, in, a, in, a, in a previous life. He's a friend of mine. I consider him a brother. His name is Sultan Muhammad. He's a former gang member, former prisoner who has done extraordinary work in reducing violence in some of the toughest communities and schools in our area. I know because I'm a witness. I used to work alongside of him as a former police officer. And talking is important because you got to get the ball going. But at some point, that talk got to be translated into action. Um, Frederick Douglass made a quote, and I'll re recite it. He said, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. That is the, the essence of Real Talk Incorporated Youth Violence Prevention Education Program. Based on my experience, I discovered that an ounce of youth violence prevention education is worth more than a pound of intervention. And I'm glad to hear Captain Doyle say that. You know, and, and, and you may not know what I mean by when you said it, but see, I have a book here, and it's a small book. But sometimes the best said is the less said. And in this book, over 75% of all the actual facts that the doctor, Reverend Starsky, and Captain Doyle highlighted is actually in this book because I'm an ex-game member. And, and being an ex-game member, like you said, you have young people who live, they don't have no other work, no other option. They don't pay the rent. They don't make a decision to move in the community. So they have to work with what they got to work with until they grow and possibly do better. And I do mean possibly do better when you look at the reality, that the challenges that they're up against. So in saying all of that, I can, it, my mind is just going in so many different directions, I don't know where to start from. But what I will cover, and I'll wave this, because this is some good information that I wanted to share. We talk about funding. We talk about being sponsored. But it was a question that was raised by, by a son to his father after he completed his chores. And his father looked at him and he told his son, don't ask what must be done, just get up and do something. As I speak, because the name of the program is called Real Talk, so I have to keep it real. So I apologize if I'm a little bit too raw. I've toned it down tremendously if anybody know me in this room, okay? That's the CFO, and I know he don't really like for me to highlight him. This man, could you raise your hand, Mr. Pichon? Victor Pichon. I, I have only a small time frame, so I want to say the more. I want to say less, more, or more or less. This man saw a young brother at the bread company who was unemployed, strung a gun hole on saving as many young people as he possibly could. No money. Good ideals, practical ideals, based on experience and observation. Why am I saying this? Because this man worked 34 years for the IRS. So he knows all about nonprofit organizations and 
articles of incorporation, and y'all know if a man ain't got no money, it's kind of hard to get that together. So he, I asked him how much would he charge me to get this uh, paperwork done. And he went home, and he came back, and he met me at the bread company, and he gave me the paperwork, and I asked him how much he would charge me, and he looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, it's free. He said, in addition to that, I'm going to give you a year worth of my time, free of charge. And it's been five years now. <laughs> because what he understands is anytime you got somebody raw like me on the scene who come from the gutter and make it to this stage, and has a strong message that can impact the entire community. I'm talking about University City in particular today. And I'm so grateful of moving into U City and being able to use my experience to impact a community that has the potential of actually duplicating St. Louis, North St. Louis, and Los Angeles, California, if we don't be proactive instead of reactive. So through his representation, he has plugged me into the entire community from the police department to the local government to the community and the school district. So we say, it said it takes a village. You have a whole community collectively. You know, we have our little struggles and all that stuff. But how we avoid it in closing is we have this policy. It's called no lines drawn in the sand. So when the politicians come and try to get us to go this way, we tell them, no, thank you, thank you, but no, thank you. Because, see, we're not getting ready to get involved in none of it. And whether we get funded or not, the same way I had that drive and that vision to go ahead and do something, we're going to continue to keep this thing going because we started a program that's about the 13th week with about five young people. And you would think that now that it's getting hotter or warmer, that the attendance would decrease. But guess what? Last, this Wednesday just passed, we had 70, 64 children. When it was hot, gun ho on coming to Real Talk. We do an hour of workshops and an hour of recreation and refreshments. And guess what? Nobody has funded. We do this because we love it. If you don't love this work, you ain't going to be successful. We know we need resources, but until we get those resources, we're going to continue to do what we do because it's making an astronomical impact. To the next presenter, who I've also known for many years, our fathers were friends. Uh, his, his younger brother, Gerald, and I were teammates uh, on a little league baseball team that our fathers coached. His father was a police officer. He left the police department to go to work for the Dr. Martin Luther King Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia, where he became the director of, what was his title? Director of Training and Education for the Dr. Martin Luther King Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia, Mr. Charles Alvin Sr. This is Charles Alvin Jr., who has put together a work that is based on the teachings of Dr. King and has gone all over the world with dramatic results, including here in the United States, addressing violence in our community. Just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I think they were in, was it Nigeria three summers ago? With armed rebels, young people, young people, 13, 14, some of them as young as, as 10 and 11, walking around with those AR-15s and they, those military-style assault weapons that the president wants to get rid of and, and get rid of those magazines, they all had them. And they had a real rivalry over there. They were killing people. Not over foolishness. I'm sure it was something more substantive that they felt like they were warring over. But this brother and some others went over there and at some point, after several months, had those warring factions seated around a table discussing together how they would work to ensure that no future generation would ever go through what they had just put each other through. Remarkable results. You know, uh, when Red
ready to ask me to come and be on this panel. You know, ready to say, look, I want you to be on this panel because you know a lot of people say that there's uh, too much talking, and I need to have people on the panel that is doing some things. And I agree. You know, I, in St. Louis, we do a lot of town home meetings and a lot of talking, and that's just it. You know, I've I've given my chance and my opportunity to go to a lot of them. And my goal is let's let's get something going, you know. And I, I know a lot of the brothers that are on this this panel here today, uh, and I must say they all are doing some work. Uh, and with relationship to gun violence, you know, I always say we, we, we don't have a problem with guns because guns don't kill people; people kill people. Okay. Now the laws we need to have need to be stricter and enforced, and be able to be enforced. To give you an example. Uh, President Barack Obama has had for six years trying to appoint an ATF director, which in fact the Republicans are actually a part of the reason why they have it. Because guess what? He can't. You can't enforce the laws without a director. They're they're handcuffed basically. So under the current laws with the ATF, the bureau, the bureau is prohibited from creating a federal registry about the guns. So we had to ask ourselves, why is that? Okay? So we have all these problems. The laws are here. They're broken. The system is broken, what Reverend Starsky was talking about. The system is broken. The laws in place is broken. So if we continue to sit by the side and not stand up and demand for it to be fixed, because a lot of us today are standing on the, the side, saying that it's broken, not jumping into the water to try to get it fixed. So what we have to do is mobilize and organize. And my organization is called Building Life Foundation's Nonviolence Center, and we train, educate, and research on Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence, exactly what we're doing in Atlanta. When the, the King Center in Atlanta talks about training youth in the Summer Institute, they call me and I come over and I deal with youth in Atlanta. We get them certified. We've trained some of the youth at University City that went to Atlanta and got certified as certified Kingian nonviolence trainers now. We're currently in the Ferguson Florissant School District where Superintendent Art McCoy and Reddit Hudson have brought this together, where we're in the process of formulating this with PBIS so that the students can get steeped in nonviolence and the principles of nonviolence and how to get out of a conflict, as well as the teachers can get steeped in this. Because it's all about education, okay? And Dr. King looked at the violence and gun violence and violence as a whole, holistically. We have to attack it holistically. And what we have to do, his utopia was a beloved community. And what we have to do is get all of six entities together. And these six entities are law enforcement. We have to get local businesses together. We have to get uh, community organizations together, youth together. We have to get uh, the businesses and local organizations all together. The churches have to be involved in community organizations and actually for all six of these entities to work to bring about a change in the community. So when we talk about gun violence, we talk about violence as a whole, Everyone in this room has participated in violence. We look at violence as physical, but we have to begin to look at it as mental, verbal, physical abuse. Because verbally, we attack one another. Every day, we're attacking someone with our words. So I want you guys to make sure that you understand that when we talk about violence, we're looking at it holistically. And what do we do? We know what to do. Like my brother read it. We've been in Nigeria. We've been in Haiti, Russia. We've been to Israel. We've been here in the United States. We're in colleges. Dr. King's last conversation with uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, who was Dr. King's strategist, was to institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. And that's what we're doing, to institutionalize it, get it into our school systems. Because it, we didn't get here overnight. We didn't get to this violence where we are today overnight. This is a long process of how we got here. So it's not going to take us overnight to get out of this. It's going to be a process. School systems are going to have to commit instead of putting a Band-Aid approach on something, getting different programs in, because programs are only to end at a certain point in time. 
if we institutionalize it, even after I'm gone and after I walk out of that school, they now have the capacity to run this on after they leave. So that's our goal is to institutionalize this and internationalize it. And what we do is we educate the young kids, like these look our future right here, we educate them in and how to not to bully. And what is bullying? Okay, and how do you get out of a conflict? I don't just tell you to stop the violence. Okay, I show you how do you get out of it. We give you principles, we give you steps, and conflict reconciliation because we don't do resolution, we teach reconciliation because resolution as a whole resolves but doesn't solve. Because if I fight in school and I suspend you, we're going to fight outside the school. But if I reconcile the problem, that means that my once enemy is now a friend. I turn my enemy into a friend and we go on to bigger and higher things to teach other kids how not to fight into the school. So that's our goal as far as reconciliation. How do we reconcile a problem? Every problem cannot be reconciled, and I understand that, but we have to be able to understand that you're entitled to your opinion and I'm entitled to mine, and it's okay that we disagree. And once we can get to that point and understand it without escalating it to violence, this world will be a much better place. So in closing, what I want to talk about is how do we begin to do this? So we have to get those six entities together, and I believe one of the... the stumbling points we have in St. Louis is some organizations don't want to work with other organizations. We have to learn how to work together, like Reverend Starsky said, and others. How do we combine our efforts and combine our resources without somebody saying, well, I want to be on the top, or I want to have the money? If you're in it for the money, you're in it for the wrong reason. I walk the other way. Okay? I look at doing the right thing for the right reason, for the right cause, and everything else happens. It's all about where's your heart? Because if we don't take care of our kids, we've already have failed them so far. And it's not too late. And when teachers say that they can't do anything with this class and they give up, I look at them and I say, don't give up. There's still hope because I have met lots of teachers that have given up. We can't give up. I won't stop. I, I've, I've come from one side of the tracks, even though my parents were both with me and the one was a policeman. But you know what they say about policemen's sons and preacher's daughters? How <laughs> I lived up to that, that saying as far as being a policeman's son. I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of, but today I can say that I've changed my life. Uh, and when I'm in front of students and kids, I can, I can truly say that uh, I had an oil ordeal when I was in front of some Vashon kids down in, in the city. And they said, you know, you probably never had a fight a day in your life. <laughs> well, today I told them, I said, you know, today I can take that as a compliment. But had 10 years ago, not even about 15 years ago, we would have had some words in a different manner. But today I could say, you know, I take that as a compliment. And like we said, I've been all over the world and we trained 20,000 Nigerians, militants, in Dr. King's philosophy and they lay their arms down. We understand your struggle when you fight, even in a city. But our goal is, let's not fight with the guns. Let's fight with this. Dr. King, like J. Edgar Hoover said that Dr. King was the most dangerous man alive, and he didn't have a gun. He put the most powerful army in the nation at rest, and they didn't know what to do with him. And he didn't have a gun. He used this. And he also used, how do you mobilize and organize communities? And that's what he knew how to do. And they said it, he was the most dangerous man alive, and they had to get rid of him. So with that, I close, and I continue to uh, wish blessings on you, and hopefully that you will come out and join us because we're opening up a nonviolent school here in St. Louis, the first nonviolent center in the state of Missouri. Uh, we'll be doing that, and you'll hear a lot more things come to come with us. All right? Thank you. Just piggybacking on what you were saying, Chuck, about institutionalizing nonviolence. I think that's one of the things we really need to take a look at when it comes to inner city communities around the country. Yes, our schools face challenges, and we know them well, but I think that our children, just the statistics that I've cited here and what we know is happening in cities around the country, I think that our children 
are so at risk, so at risk when it comes to gun violence that programs like this, and neither one of them really went into great detail about their statistical success. It was this before we got there, it was this after, but they, um, trust me, they have records that they can show you. Programs like this, to me, need to become part of curriculum. Curriculum. If I had a son now who was five years old, getting ready to start school, I would want him to learn A, B, C, one, two, three, and then I would want these gentlemen, or some men or women like them, to hold them in a classroom and talk to them collectively about their reality and what it is they can do for each other to change their own lives and each other's lives. I think that needs to be a consideration. Um, we have saved the last part of, of, of this part of our gathering for a woman who's going to come up and share her personal experience. Um, I'm going to take a liberty, Mr. President, Madam President, of, of not giving her any time that you, you have as long or as short as you like uh, to speak about your personal experience with crime and violence in our communities. Her name is Ms. Tarika Riley, and uh, please uh, hear from her. When I got the call to come to this meeting, I was wondering, like, wow. It's, it's almost been a year that I lost my daughter, Cornisha. She was 14. To know that there's people out here still working towards her case. Because I had thought the police and everyone, the media and everyone gave up. But when I got that call from the detective and he told me that they were still working on her case, oh my God. <laughs> I just got a chill through my body that I can't even explain. I'm nervous. I lost my daughter, Cornisha. She was 14 years old. She was at a playground at a friend's house. Fights jumped off. Well, it started flying innocent bystanders, you know, lost their life, gone at 14. Um, I haven't seen any of her friends since the day all this happened. No parents, no anything. Only person I had by my side through this whole thing and foremost is God, and he brought me a long, long way. Um, I have my children, I have other children, but I try to be strong for them, but only God's been there for me. Um, and I'm here, and I'm blessed to see all, all y'all is trying to work with the communities, uh, for us, the violence and stuff, but just don't forget about the South Side, <laughs> because this violence is on the South Side, too. You know, I know y'all haven't seen them, you know, but it's moving there, you know. They're coming from the North, the West, to the South, you know. So violence is everywhere, and I just want everyone to just keep keep hope alive for our youth because I still have two young boys coming up out here, and I appreciate if the world would be a little better by the time they become teenagers. We have now uh, an opportunity uh, for those of you want to ask a question or share an insight, we do have a microphone available uh, if you want to come forward at any point in time uh, in lieu of you coming forward or while you think of a question that you may want to ask or a statement that you may want to make, I have for the panelists, and then you can answer any way that you like to, some questions of my own that I think will help us also shape uh, a strategy uh, that will allow us to continue to build on known successes so that we are taking action and expanding that which has been proven successful um, and moving in the right direction and limiting um, a waste of time potentially on things that haven't worked. So uh, my question for the panelists at this point uh, is relative to root causes. What do you think specifically some of them are when you talk about violence in our communities? And more importantly, what can we do? What can people in their own communities who may not hold a position, uh, 
such as yourselves do to begin addressing some of these root causes? all of us highlighted, but I think he put uh, real strong emphasis on it. It's been going on. Let's, let's just start with City of St. Louis alone. We're just going to talk about Crippin' Blood because that's my experience. We're talking about 85, 86, and it's 2013 now. So we're talking about over two decades or more. Just try to imagine the number of lives that's been lost between that, that point to this point right here. This is somebody's daughter. This is somebody's son, homeboy, etc. So you're talking about guys that's, I mean, that's got so much going on emotionally. It's going to take a nuclear blast to kind of uproot it, but you got to start from somewhere. So trying to really get to the root, like you said, just highlighting some of the root causes. But at the root of it, we're still talking about poverty. We're talking about uh, uh, miseducation. We're talking about a plethora of things. And so the uh, solution has to be holistic in nature. It ain't just political, it ain't just economical, it ain't just educational, it's all the above. Reverend Wilson. Yeah, so absolutely we echo that there's a correlation between the crime that we see in our neighborhoods and poverty. So that we know. So this ecological model has to be taken, as Dr. Ross said. Uh, but in the specific there, we recognize that early childhood education, quality early childhood education um, is an investment that reduces um, that reduces violence and violent behavior later on. Why? Because social, sc social skills are developed early. So uh, there's a, a one economist who talks about what's called the Heckman equation. So when we talk about making this case that investments in early childhood development, quality early childhood programs in our neighborhoods uh, pay off in the reduction of violence long term and in economic returns later because children who go through early quality early childhood programs uh, become beneficial to the community and taxpayers. So when we talk about things in our community, so take the state of Missouri, this conversation right now by Nathan's Law, making sure that there is equitable oversight of early childhood programs throughout the state of Missouri or in St. Louis public schools, when you talk about SLPS getting involved in the early childhood business and what that does to independent nonprofit early childhood centers, um, this has social impact. Now, I'll make it personal. Um, just for a second, look, I, everybody loves grandma. I love grandma. I stay with grandma during the summers. But the reality is, if grandma does not have the skills to provide early childhood development to our kids, then we got to get more of our kids in environments where someone knows a social development model for early childhood. And, and grandma, we got to negotiate with and, and socialize with in another way. Because that experience will mean better educational outcomes, more peaceful outcomes in our neighborhoods, and better economic returns in the future. And we got to be able to speak that language, and we've got to invest in that for our children. Because what they learn early stays with them forever. And if we don't invest early, no matter what it costs, then we will pay the price later on. Captain Doyle. Going back to my earlier statement, uh, read it. Uh, again, self-esteem. I'm going to give you a personal story real quick. We went through school. Um, I did great. Elementary, middle school. However, when I got to high school, my grades started slumping. Now that I'm older and more mature, I can do self-evaluation. I realize why my grades had dropped. Reason being is because I lost interest. Reason I lost interest because, again, I just have to be upfront and raw about this is that when I went through school, I learned that we came here of a slave ship, and then from a slave ship, bam, we were just here. Had I known that prior to us being slaves, that we were kings, queens, we lived on the most prominent continent on the face of the earth, it would have changed my whole vision on how I seen the world. I say all that to say this. Currently, right now, I don't care if you're from St. Louis to Detroit to Washington, D.C., the education system has to be inclusive. Inclusive to the point to where it's what you have, white history, you got to have black history, Asian history, and all of it has to be um, 
balance, if that makes sense. You know, you can take a, I don't care what school your kid's in right now, you can pull up a history book right now, and it'll take you to page 300 before you actually see a black face. So until you make education inclusive and make kids, especially those of African American, feel proud of who themselves, you can continue to have a problem because again, had I have known that we had kings and queens prior to us being slaves, my vision would have been a lot more broader today than being a law enforcement officer. Again, I, this is a noble profession, I'm proud that I do it, but again, had I, my thought process would have been different, I would have been running this country right now. You know, so. Did we have a question? Yes. I have a question and a comment, uh, and Commander Doyle, thank you for your comment, but we, are not, we were not slaves, our people were not slaves, they were enslaved and it makes a difference in how you consider that conversation. We were enslaved Africans, but we were not born slaves. Um, um, shame. Okay, um, several years ago, I attended a um, peace vigil that was sponsored by gang members in Denver, Colorado, former gang members and gang intervention task force, Prodigal Son Initiative, some of you may have heard of them before, yeah, probably because it was started by former a former blood who uh, was shot several times and then got religion. But anyway, um, he and a guy named Cisco from the West Side with Del Norte and some other gangs held a peace vigil, and they brought in the the medium to the oracle of the Dalai Lama and about five monks, Buddhist monks. And there were people, there were clergy there from every faith. We were in a Buddhist center. And I have to say, he made a very powerful statement through his translator. He said, we don't really need a peace movement so much as you need individuals to wake up and walk in peace on a daily basis. So if you wake up in the morning intentional upon peace, in your home, in your family, on your job, driving into work, at the grocery store, it goes a long way toward furthering peace. And I know that sounds very simplistic, but when I am mindful of it and I try it, it really does work. And it doesn't matter what faith you're in. And then that leads into my question, how do we get the focus not just on violence, and anti-violence, but I love my pastor over here, Pastor Wilson, hey. <laughs> but also on peace. How do we focus on peace? I'm a member of the U.S. Peace Alliance because I kind of stumbled into it, and they do a monthly call, but I almost never, ever, never, ever, ever, ever hear another woman of color or person of color on those monthly calls. They have a national organization. They've got offices around in in D.C., they're getting federal funding. And which organization is that? It's the U.S. Peace Alliance. Okay. Because they want, they, their goal is to establish a department of peace. We have a war department, why not a peace department in America? But the challenge I have, um, how do we bring that conversation of peace and organizing around peace, not just nonviolence, which is the other side of the coin, but around peace, because when I entertain that, when I mean, when I introduce that subject to people, I usually get, get mocked. They're like, eh, that's funny, sister, but you know, we don't have time for a peace department. You know, we got real issues, you know, with poverty and da, 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 da. But I, you know, I contend and I believe poverty is an act of violence. Genocide is an act of violence. Sexism is an act of violence. Racism is an act of violence. So how do we move the conversation beyond violence to peace and get our people mobilized in peace movements? I think that's well said, my sister. Uh, but a lot of people don't even know what peace look like. We all have different definitions of what peace is. And let me just tell you, say, Dr. King said that there's two different types of peace. You have a negative peace and a positive peace. When there's a negative peace, negative peace is when there's still poverty, war, and racism. That's negative peace. Positive peace is when justice exists. So how do we move from 
talking about nonviolence, which in in definition of nonviolence, when we talk about nonviolence, nonviolence is the antidote to violence. It's the cure. Uh, and when we talk about violence is a, a, a much bigger symptom of a much bigger cause. When we talk about root cause and when we talk about gangs, we know what gets your, your, your people and your youngsters in the gangs. You know, love, without love, wanting. Uh, but how do we move to a movement of peace? I think that's a, a, a holistic thing of what we talk about in, in a holistic piece because the world moves so fast today, nobody's thinking. I think that comes from when we go into churches and our ministers. Uh, I think that comes from some type of meditation at home. I think that comes with also uh, community building, taking care of our communities and what we what what is our beloved community? Like I said, Dr. King had one of the beloved community. You know, a beloved community means that we help each other out, we lift each other up to their highest potential.